last time on the other side, we presented the first half of our interview featuring Imam Faisal Rauf and Rabbi Firestone. Today, we are pleased to present the rest of that interview. And the war in Iraq, of course, has, um, has done a great deal uh, as far as destabilizing the region, the entire Middle East. And I want to ask Rabbi Reuven Firestone, um, you know, if we look at uh, George Bush Jr., who talked about a crusade against terror, and we look at ISIS today and their use uh, of jihad, religious struggle, holy war, um, is there any argument at all for including religion within politics or that religion or faith could play some role within politics today? Um, if you could just comment a little bit about the role of religion in politics, both within the U.S. and without, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, do you see that as inherently something that is flawed and uh, destructive, or can religion play a positive role in politics? Your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, religions emerged. Uh, we do a lot of work on the emergence of religion. Um, what, how do religions emerge into history? Because there's a period of time when there was no Islam. There was a period of time when there was no Christianity. So there's a before and there's a during. There's no after yet. So um, what, what, how, how and why do religions emerge into history? And they're, they're from a historical and social science perspective, I'm not talking about a theological perspective. From a theological perspective, each religion has its own understanding of its relationship with God and God revealing the divine word uh, at a moment in history when it's particularly needed. But from a historical and social science perspective, religions emerge into history when there's a need, when needs are not being fulfilled. And uh, the three uh, scriptural monotheisms that we know best, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all emerged into history in a world in which there were problems with governance, problems with civil and civic rights of the region in which it emerged. And so these religions took on, as part of its divinely authorized responsibility, the need to govern people. And that included not only believers, but when power uh, was gained by the communities of believers, it also had to do with governing non-believers as well. And, and that was very important, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's not the way that we're doing government today. Today we're doing government in a, uh, in a manner that separates from the needs and particularities of religion. So religion has a lot to say about governance, but religion also has a lot to say about the purpose for governance, justice, um, uh, equality, uh, uh, giving people their, their rights. Uh, uh, this is all part of the religious basis for religious governing. Today, because of the contention between religious communities in general that's kind of established by the notion of monotheism. I don't want to go there at this moment, but that's, a, that's an important and, uh, and interesting and important issue to discuss. But because of that um, essential uh, kind of competition between which form of God's will is the more true form of God's will, religion shouldn't be directly involved in governance. Uh, but religious values, and I mean the generic re religious values of the dignity of the individual, respect for the needs and rights of people to realize their own spiritual well-being and their physical well-being, that I think should be at the core of secular government. So I don't see a problem with religion being, or I don't see a problem with religion informing government. But if we're trying to establish Christian religious principles, let's say, in a, in a governing system that is governing Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Sikhs and all kinds of other people, that I think is wrong. So you, if, I, if I understand what you're saying correctly, then it's kind of the general religious principles, these humanistic principles, you kind of do unto others as you want done, done unto you. That's okay in, to employ within a political sphere, but not a particular kind of religious tradition, something, something in that order. Right. I, I would call them, yes, you could call them humanistic principles, but I would also call them religious principles. I think it's perfectly fine to call them religious principles. I also think that those principles are not a monopoly of religious people. I think there are secular people and there are atheists that have very similar principles 
identical principles, and they may not call them religious principles, but they would call them, as you mentioned, humanistic principles. And, and Imam, your thoughts then on religion and politics? Does one poison the other? Does one, does one hijack the other, just to push? Uh, well, here's the thing. I think when, when the, the American concept of separation of church and state is really a, 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 a manifestation or one aspect of the separation of powers doctrine. I do not see it as a complete firewall between, but what it means in the American context to me is that the coercive powers of the state may not be used to further or advance one religion or one sectarian interpretation at the expense of another. It should treat all, all religious uh, groups identically and, and more importantly um, should not oppress any particular religious group. And that's how I understand the separation of church and state in this country uh, to mean. Uh, I agree that the, uh, that, the, that the values of religion in terms of humanitarian values, charity, uh, help for the poor and the marginalized, which are religious principles, are, are things that government should in fact do. And, and help do, and this is what way we have in, in, in the United States and many developed countries, uh, a very, very good social safety net for, the, for those who are marginalized in our societies to make sure they don't live a, a life with, without any sense of dignity. Um, but the problems come and, uh, in Israel, in the Muslim world, when the, when the coercive powers of the state are used to, in, to, to uh, to, to, to um, uh, heighten and strengthen one group and marginalize the others. And I think this is where the problems have come. Um, now, the, the issue with, with a proper, I mean, the, the, in our Islamic tradition, there is a body of law which goes back more than a thousand years, which was developed by scholars on the right ruler, what the ruler should be doing, uh, the ideal ruler. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have a, a very sophisticated and a very highly developed understanding and this heritage needs to be brought out because at the height of what made the Muslim past great was because they manifested this highly nuanced understanding where the, where, where the, 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 the ruler ha had to protect every religious community. I mean, in Iran until recently, uh, in, in India, you have, they protected all religious communities, not, not to oppress or to eliminate other religious uh, faith communities. And that's the tragedy and the, viol the supreme violation that people like ISIS have done. True. Absolutely. It's, it's really enlightening and sobering to hear um, from both of you that um, by delving into the tradition itself, the age-old tradition over a thousand years old, that we are able to, in this, uh, in our world today, uh, shall we say moderate or uh, provide a little bit more moderation to uh, religious discourse um, and that Sharia and the religious tradition itself is not the problem but could actually be a solution? Well understood, properly understood and properly applied, it is. Uh, but the issue really is the issue between, between state and church or state and religion uh, is, is an important subject that has to be understood. I mean, as, a, as a, the late Professor Mazuroi said in a brilliant lecture, um, there's no separation of church and state in England. Uh, he, the point he was making was we need to differentiate between separation of church and state and separation between religion and politics. He said, in England, you have no separation of church and state. The Queen is the head of the Church of England, and she appoints the Archbishop of Canterbury. And I remember uh, the secretary, uh, you know, John Bishop, I believe, said, uh, I forget, John, Jack Straw, Jack Straw, in Davos, saying, I don't know why the Americans have this fetish about separation of church and cities. I appoint bishops. And everybody started <laughs> cracked up laughing. But there is a separation of religion and politics in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the United Kingdom. Whereas the opposite example is India, where you have an official separation of, let's say, the temple and state, but there's no separation between, between religion and politics. They really are. And he said that, he, he, he posited that the United States is somewhere in between, where we have a separation of church and state, but we don't have a very, I mean, influence, politics and religion bleed into each other 
in 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 uh, in, in our in our American uh, uh, demographic. So um, I, I think we need to to nuance our understanding of these issues. But it's critically important, I think. The issue is good governance, mm -hmm. you see. The issue the, that everybody wants is good, effective governance. And the word democracy has been misunderstood and misapplied by, by in many ways. The idea that the ruler should have the approval of the, of, of the, of the governed, uh, we'll call it the Bayahai Pledge of Allegiance or you know, vote, whatever it is, is important. But in this country, we have structures. We have balance of powers, we have separations of powers, which are part of our democracy. And many, many people in our country believe that just by going to Libya and, or Iraq, letting people vote, you have democracy. No, it, it's not just the, the ballot box. I mean, we, we have a democracy here, but we have uh, a very, I mean, one of the most important separations of powers that we have in this country is a, power, is a separation between the military and the, and the, and the government. I mean, you don't have a situation here where the, where the rule of the military can just send tanks into Washington and say, hey, these clowns in the White House are doing a lousy job. I can do a better job and take over power. Sure. This happens in many parts of the sure, world. This is what Sisi did in Egypt. Right. Okay? Right. Right. So this, this concept of separation of powers is not just between the judiciary, the executive branch, and legislative branch. It exists with the military. It exists with the, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the Federal Reserve. You don't have a president who can call up the, uh, the central bank governor and say, you know what, I'm running for re-election. Can you lower interest rates by two points? This doesn't happen in this country. And, and, and it is these separations which, which create the balance of powers and right distances of the, of the different centers of power that results in good and effective governance, which is what people want. They want the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness deliverables. So when we look, when we use the word democracy and just say, well, let's have them vote and we think everything will happen downhill, that's a myth. And that's dangerous. And we've seen the results of what has happened because it doesn't result in good governance. People want good governance, which is why people in, in countries like the Emirates, for example, okay, it's not a democracy. But more people are, more, more, most people in the Arab and Muslim world would love to, love to go to Dubai and live in a country like the Emirates than live in their own countries, even though they may be more democratic, quote unquote, because it's the net results of good governance that people want. We'll be right back after this short break. On the other side, we interview a variety of people and seek to examine their beliefs, their opinions, and their passions. Then we invite them to come with us to the other side and look at the antithesis of their views. What comes out is an in-depth conversation without the vitriol of the talk shows but a cerebral engaging of ideas you will not find anywhere else. Come join us on alternate Saturdays on this channel. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the other side, contact us at the email address on the screen. time that we have, I want to switch gears a little bit as we talk about the United States now and ask uh, uh, Rabbi Reuven Firestone a question. Um, when we look uh, to this election season, which is quite unique and colorful uh, in many ways, um, I want to get your thoughts on the rhetoric and the discourse on terrorism and this word terrorism and associating terror with maybe one group and not with another. So in 2015, there were between three and 400 mass shootings in the US alone, which is something on the order of one a day. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those shootings, uh, or these acts of terror or hate crimes, whatever we want to call them, were not committed by Muslims. They were committed by non-Muslims. And yet the overarching kind of perception that we get from the media and from some of our elected officials even uh, is to fear Islam and uh, that somehow there are ISIS sleeper cells in the U.S. And wh where is this lopsided perception coming from, in your opinion? The, what is the driving force behind these acts of terror or these acts of extreme violence or mass violence in the United States? The, the driving uh, uh, push uh, may vary from location to location. Um, 
I attended a conference recently uh, that was called uh, The Allure of Terrorism, What Invites Young People to Join ISIS and These Radical Groups, and it was sponsored uh, by Rutgers University with uh, support from the United Nations, and there were a wonderful group of people, many uh, from Iraq, uh, Kurdistan, Turkey, uh, Nigeria, uh, Libya, who were there, and we were talking about what, what is it that, that brings people, uh, it involves people in this kind of act, these radical acts. And uh, it soon became apparent, it actually was quite interesting, because one of the, uh, one of the results of this was that uh, we learned that the, the same issues and the same situations drive young people to join ISIS that drive young people to commit acts of mass violence in the United States and in Europe. Very similar kind of motivations. Um, uh, destabilized family, uh, problems with relations with family and parents, uh, young people who uh, are not making it well, uh, a, a low level of mental instability. Um, and another uh, series of criteria that when, when we collated all the data together, we realized they're the same, same vectors that are driving human behavior. Uh, so if that is indeed the case, and it kind of looks like it is, then essentially there's no difference between you know, Joe Blow, who commits uh, an act, a mass shooting in uh, Milwaukee, let's just say, I'm just using this randomly, and Muhammad, who commits a mass shooting in another location in the United States. But, but when it's Muhammad who, do, who does it, we say, this is Islam, that's the driving force. And when it's Joe Blow who does it, we say, this poor kid, or he was an idiot, or, you know, we, we have a little bit more unstable. compassion. Yeah. Yes. Sure. And um, there's a reason for that, too. And, and it's not just politics. Uh, I think the reason is very deep. And it is a, a long history of tension between uh, Western identity and the Muslim world. Now, the, uh, where do we begin with this? When Islam emerged into history, it represented a tremendous threat to the Christian world because, the, because Christianity had Islam emerged into history in the seventh century. Christianity, only two or three hundred years, had demonstrated its wonderful success in Christianizing the Roman Empire. And when that occurred, um, Christian thinkers saw that amazing change from one generation in which Christians were massacred in the arenas as spectacles and entertainment for the Romans to t literally 20 years later becoming a legalized religion in the Roman Empire, and then within a generation after that becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire, some Christian thinkers thought in a very logical way that this was God's design. This was, this was what God wanted. History proves the truth of theology. And that result was very effective, and it made people feel very comfortable about the Christianization of the pagan Roman Empire. History proves theology. And then within a couple of hundred years, out of this primitive desert to the south, emerges a movement, a monotheist movement, that is so successful that it essentially gobbles up the majority of the lands of the Roman Empire into a new religious monotheistic world a new empire with a new understanding of the divine will through what we know today as Islam. And, and that was a huge shock to the Christian world. And by the way, Muslims were then saying the same thing that Christians were saying a few generations earlier. History proves the truth of Islam. Islam is the true religion because God would never have allowed or encouraged or enabled us to be successful if this were not the divine will. So this was such an existential shock to Christian thinkers that they looked at Islam and they said, this can't be. This can't be a true religion. Muhammad can't be a true prophet. If Muhammad was receiving messages that were transcendent, it couldn't have been from God. It must have been from Satan. It must have been from the devil. So this is a devilish religion. This is something to be feared. Muhammad is not a true prophet. And 
And those theological responses soon became embedded in Christian culture through sermons, through stories, eventually through art. You can see it in the art of Europe, actually. And uh, th this kind of fear and apprehension that's associated with Islam became deeply embedded in Christian and then Western culture. So we have, I think, everyone in the West that grows up in a Christian in informed Western society has a certain anxiety toward Islam in general. That is a latent anxiety that then becomes activated uh, when certain things happen like 9-11 or when tensions in the Middle East become threatening to America. Then that triggers a kind of emotive, emotive and emotional response. So we overreact and we define uh, and categorize what is perhaps not, nothing has anything to do necessarily with Islam as Islamically motivated or religiously motivated. Mm -hmm. Do you see what the rabbi said uh, in terms of Western culture, Western civilizations, kind of inheritance of this bias, this, uh, uh, d this discriminatory attitude towards uh, Islam as being reflected in our political scene today in the U.S. and maybe I, I, in some, some among, among the GOP especially? I, I, I see that, but I also, um, if you don't mind my pushing back a little bit on this, I, I also believe that we as Muslims um, have, have played into that, have played into that. And um, uh, maybe not deliberately or deliberatively, but uh, you know, the fact is that Al-Qaeda, ISIS, have used the vocabulary and terminology of Islam. I mean, if they used it, if they said that we are uh, the movement for justice in uh, in Iraq, are you know, used names that are, people understand, um, uh, you know, if it's a civil rights, a civil rights movement for a group of people calling themselves whatever, Sunnis or Iraqis or whatever, I don't think you would have the same fear at all. Uh, it's because we ourselves have used this language. I mean, ISIS says the Islamic State, Al Qaeda. You know, the uh, uh, they use they, they and they use Islamic ideas, Islamic vocabulary, uh, and this is what um, you know gives the fear of Hamas or Muslim Brotherhood. This is what f feeds and fuels, and whatever is latent latches onto that and says, see, here it is. So we have contributed to, to sustaining and, and to growing that fear. And that fear can be actually, can, can, be, can be modulated, can be attenuated. And our work is, is in that direction. And many, many Americans have gone to Muslim countries. I mean, here we are in Houston. Many people here, particularly because it's the center of the capital of the oil industry, they have relationships with Saudi Arabia, with Kuwait. They have, you know, they know people and they have friends, and the perception is different. Many Americans have gone to, 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 um, to study or to uh, to holiday in Egypt, in Morocco, in Turkey, in Indonesia, and and they realize we're just, you know, we're nice human beings too, and 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 there's increasing intermarriage and you know interrelationships. So I I, I see that while there is this history. There's also many, many, many factors that, that are working to attenuate that. There's business relationship. I mean, look, the United States has a huge platform, a huge footprint in the Muslim world. It has business interests, geopolitical interests. We have bases in, in Bahrain, in, in, in the Emirates, in, in Qatar. I mean, this small little lake of the Gulf, we have three major military bases. We have much interest. We have oil interests. So the, the, the Muslim world as such of the world is, is, is now moving almost a quarter of the global population. There's a lot of engagement going on. A lot of it is very, very positive. There's intermarriage going on. I'm conducting weddings, I mean, between Bangladeshis with, with Greek, Irish, Americans, Jews, and Muslims. I mean, it's happening on a daily basis in this country and in Europe and our part of the world. So the good news is, I think we can attenuate that. And, and the forces of attenuating are there. Uh, it just, we have to solve these problems which have been packaged in Islamic vocabulary. If we address these problems, 
I think the unitive or uniting unitive forces of the world, the, the forces which tend to bring people together, forces of, of, of love, of, of, of business interests, of social interests, will, bring, will naturally bring the world together. Just resolve these conflicts. I mean, as I have said, if the, if the issue in Israel, with, between Israel and Palestine, of, as of human rights, economic rights, and political rights are addressed, I of the political and economic rights alone are addressed. I mean, I've been to Israel, and, and there are towns which are, which, which are divided. I've been to a town, at least one town, which is divided by the Israel-Palestine border. And you, no, there's no sense of a border. Israelis, Jews go there on Friday, on Thursday to do their, sh their, their Sabbath shopping. And because that's, they, you know, they cross over and you see all the signs in, 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 in Hebrew. The, so trade will, will, will continue. Just solve the conflict. Give people economic rights. Gradually, the religious issues will, 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 will fade. And I, I would add that when I spoke about this embedded anxiety about Islam in, in Western society, there is an embedded anxiety about the Christian world also in much of the Muslim world that is deeply embedded there, and it's a result of history. Um, the rhetoric of the Crusader Zionist alliance of the, the Western oh, yeah. world wants to destroy Islam. Uh, once, if that rhetoric can be removed from the discussion and we can remove the issue of this is Islamic terrorism or this is the Judeo Christian uh, uh, conspiracy to destroy Islam, and we begin to look at the conflict, the very, there is no conflict, there are many conflicts the conflicts and resolve the issues that are at the core of the conflict, as my brother and colleague uh, Imam Faisal said, I think we can resolve these issues. But when we deal with religious terminology, we speak about the absolutes. And when there's absolutes, there's no negotiation because we can hide behind the absolute of saying God requires it. You know, Deo volt is what the Crusaders said. God wills it. And uh, when, when we speak in those kinds of terms, there's no resolution of the conflict. We have to remove the religious rhetoric. And that includes removing religious rhetoric from internal politics within our countries as well. Absolutely. I want to thank both uh, Imam Faisal Abdarouf and Rabbi Reuven Firestone for a discussion that was uh, quite insightful and full of wisdom. Thank you both. Thank you well, for thank having you. us. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed this as much as I did. Special thanks to Farah Kilidar and the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston for sharing these remarkable men with us. Join us next time as we bring another guest to the other side. <laughs>